am Pat Rawson. I am the co-founder of Curve Labs. And for the past five years of my life, I have been trying to get people to create DAOs in the real world. I saw a lot of value in this technology at uh, a very early time in this industry. And it's something that I want to bring to life. And I'm still working to bring it to life. Thank you for the sign. Um, today we're going to talk about socio-ecological systems design, which is a, a bit of a mouthful. We're going to talk about why SES is important for Web3. We're going to talk about the design patterns that we're seeing across the Web3 refi space today. Uh, and we're going to talk about the future. So this, this talk is going to be a mix of systems design and, and architecture, which is kind of my, my favorite things to speak about. They're very practical. What, what is an SES? Uh, a, socio, a social ecological system consists of a biogeophysical unit and its associated social factors and institutions. And uh, for me, the institutional part of this is the, the biggest revolution that Web3 has to offer, um, mainly because we have programmable institutions today, and they're called DAOs. But kind of going from left to right in this diagram uh, ripped from Wikipedia, um, we, we start with these social institutions and values um, that lead to individual and collective choices. Those collective choices uh, express themselves as policies and interventions in, for instance, a local economy. And one such policy could be something like a subsidy for development. So you go, you go out and you, you build your houses. That's the human activity part of this. And this actually has... Uh, 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 consequences in the ecosystem structure and the processes because uh, what you didn't consider is when you built that house you built it next to a coral reef uh, all that dust came off and now the reef is bleached and dead and it is never coming back so this um, fundamentally alters the ecosystem function because that coral reef was stopping the tide from coming in it was disrupting the tide so you could build there in the first place it was providing this ecosystem service and now you have a lower quality of life because your house floods every year. And that's how these systems work. Uh, it, it, the left-hand side has a, a typo here with the carbon offset credit production. That's only supposed to exist on the right. But uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that traditionally this has been framed, or the institutional framing of this has been uh, polycentric commons governance. So um, this was Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, she was already discussed in another talk. Um, she was the one who initially framed this, and she, she framed socio-ecological systems as a system of stewardship of shared resources. So you can think pastures, reefs, uh, you know, any of these ecosystem assets that they might be discussing when they discuss the tragedy of the commons. Um, the right-hand side is, is very, very interesting, especially in the context of Web3, because when we talk about how we, we try to evaluate or we try to financialize or monetize these particular um, ecosystem services, uh, we've created a number of, of ways that don't work. <laughs> um, we have ecosystem services markets in the traditional sense. Uh, we have carbon offset and, and credit production. And, and I think that's a good place to start with intervening in these systems, but I think we can do better when it comes to ecological asset formation. Um, and then uh, it's not quite a system for monetization, but uh, governmental subsidies. You know, the government just pays for certain areas to be taken care of. So, so why do we need SES and Web3? I kind of touched on this, but first we have a new wave of programmable institutions. We have DAOs and crypto networks. I would characterize Celo as a crypto network because it is a layer one chain. You could alternatively call it a sovereign chain. Um, these DAOs plan to use uh, programmable finance, so they plan to use DeFi to intervene in our underlying material reality. And that is where ReFi comes from, regenerative finance. Um, to do so, we are probably going to have to create ecological capitals or natural capitals because, like it or not, we primarily live in a neoliberal capitalist paradigm. Uh, and th the mechanism design of these new capitals, uh, I, I believe, cannot be done in isolation relative to historical efforts. We have to understand, you know, where, where did this come from? And that way we can build on the shoulders of giants. So going back to our previous chart, you can see on the left-hand side, we kind of replace things with what we call real-world DAOs. Um, I have uh, articulated a system I call a DET, a decentralized exchange trading system, uh, which is sort of a combination of a DAO and a local exchange trading system, or LETS. And these are crypto, crypto institutions that exist out of the, the purely digital or virtual sphere. So uh, today, most DAOs, I believe almost all DAOs, uh, exist virtually. So 
um, when we think of something like Aave or Uniswap or what have you, they are governing virtual protocols. They are not intervening in our underlying material reality. Now, on the right-hand side, this is where things get interesting, especially for me, it's ecological assets or crypto ecological assets. Uh, these, these crypto assets that we create through the measurement and the tokenization of this underlying material reality, uh, the ecological state for some territory. And I think the territory part here is one of the most important parts because we are talking about a geophysical unit. We are talking about a geography. We are talking about a territory and a management system thereof. And this is um, probably the most important addition that ReFi brings to, to DeFi. We, we are talking about land and, and sea. So there's, there's kind of a re reverse hypothesis here where, you know, kind of in our arrogance, we're saying, hey, you know, SES actually need Web3. Um, and I think there's, this is actually true. I think this is valid. And there's a number of reasons for that. There's a number of advantages that Web3 brings to the table. The first is easier access to liquidity. We have 24-7 crypto markets that cannot be manipulated by centralized actors. Um, you look at what's going on in the stock market today in the United States, um, you have uh, Citadel, the, the market maker, uh, effectively cheating the system and cheating people out of money. Um, we have transparent interoperable data ecology. So we, we can see on chain the proofs that were made. We can see uh, the, the data brought forward and we have this unprecedented ability to, to really understand what's going on on the ground. Um, I believe we can create more effective financial instruments. So we can imagine something like a hyper-targeted payments for ecosystem services. Someone is caretaking for an endangered species. They provide a verifiable proof thereof. That person can get their money. You could think of this as a, a bountification type program. Um, we have a rapidly evolving programmable institutions. Uh, you know, I was the pilot manager of one of the first functioning DAOs on the Ethereum blockchain in June 2018. Uh, there was no assets under management at that, at, at that time by DAOs, and today this is a, a $20, $30 billion industry. So things have evolved very, very quickly, and it's been very exciting to see that. Um, finally, and most importantly, there's an open source ethos in Web3. Uh, we cannot live in an era of walled gardens anymore. We cannot live in an era of corporations and closed intellectual property. We are confronted by an existential crisis which threatens our future. And we're going to have to work together to solve that, which means that we can no longer have fundamentally institutions that serve uh, the republic of property as we understand it. Jamming a little bit on point four, um, this is a chart uh, providing sort of like a, a meme space, as I like to call it, um, of a number of topics. And kind of situated in the middle here is adaptive governance, and I think uh, the adaptive governance literature um, in relation to socio-ecological uh, systems. I think that's the most relevant for what we're trying to achieve. So if we want to get even more specific, um, this is the area that we're playing in. Um, and I think what we're really trying to do here uh, with crypto institutional design, the social part of these systems, is we're trying to mediate the global and the local. So if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of that chart, you have price theory, and price theory is um, fundamentally, uh, your most global abstraction, when you have Econ 101 students uh, in class drawing supply and demand curves, they are completely decontextualized from the real world attributes that that market is taking. Um, on the upper right hand side of this chart, you see human ecology and you see ecological economics. Uh, these are the most contextualized that you can get. They are really looking at the specificity of a single ecology and the particularization of a territory. And I believe that we can mediate between the two in a more effective manner. I think we've already demonstrated that DAOs are effective at global scale, and now we can demonstrate and need to demonstrate that they're effective at local scale as well. So how is ReFi approaching SES design? I, I wanted to take a look at three projects today and say very nice things about them because I consider them to be uh, leading projects in this space. The first is Trees AI. Uh, the Trees AI blue paper is the most sophisticated attempt to describe uh, the data monetization of a tree. Uh, the blue paper is something like 70 pages. Um, it was released in December of 2021, and it's incredible. I, I recommend everyone here who's serious about ReFi go read this thing. I'm not going to talk about the whole architecture. That would be a presentation in itself, but I want to highlight a few things. Um, the first, uh, looking at the purple, we can see the issuance of MBS contracts. So uh, that means nature-based solution. 
And when we see a, a, the word contract here, we understand we're dealing with a financial asset. We're dealing with a, a non-fungible, a semi-fungible, or a fungible asset. Um, with the sharding mechanisms that exist today, there is no such thing as a non-fungible asset. Any asset can be made fungible. Um, and, and what they say in their, their blue paper is they want to create impact tokens for verified and standardized impact. So uh, immediately we have an ecological asset that's being uh, attempted to be produced here. Uh, moving to the orange, they're also saying in their blue paper, hey, in the long term, we want Trees AI, the provider, to become a DAO. So we have this primitive of, of DAO governance. Um, moving south from there to the teal, uh, we have this oracle uh, with third-party verification, so uh, uh, sort of a validation mechanism for the data. And underneath that, we have what they call the Internet of Trees, uh, where they are taking these, these ecological assets uh, as they exist, they are monitoring them through a combination of, of human or participatory monitoring, um, uh, IoT devices, and remote viewing, um, either drone or satellite-based. So moving on to a second project here, the Nature Carbon Ton um, that's being produced in partnership between Regen Network and Toucan Protocol. Um, just, just focusing on the, the Regen architecture behind this, we see the same pattern. So at the, at the bottom of Regen stack, we see uh, the, the data. Um, that data is moving upwards towards these ecological state protocols, which are validation mechanisms, um, similar to the oracles that we saw in Trees AI. Um, that's moving upwards to these ecological contracts, which are ultimately um, trying to financialize and issue tokens that represent um, the value of these things. Uh, that, that, that are being measured. And the whole, uh, the whole stack, and you can see the orange box circling everything, the whole stack is governed by a crypto network. So it's governed by uh, the layer one regen network, part of the interchain ecosystem, um, a, a, another sovereign chain that kind of sits next to, to Celo. Third project, Open Forest Protocol. They are on the near blockchain. Same thing. We have, in step two here, a participatory monitoring device. There is an application where people are going and monitoring these forests and submitting that data. In step three, you have validators, again, going to this oracle or this verification mechanism. It's looking at the data, it's checking the legitimacy, and it's saying whether or not this thing is correct. And uh, going all the way to step six, uh, we have this uh, articulation of carbon financing that they're calling open carbon credits. And this is another ecological asset. This asset is being produced through the verification of this data um, from the forest. Surrounding the whole architecture, once again, there is a DAO, the Open Forest DAO, which is governing this entire protocol. So I've already discussed this, but what patterns are we tangibly seeing here? First, monitoring mechanism. Second, validation. Third, um, some sort of mechanism which is saying, OK, this is how we tokenize this data. Um, and fourth, there is a governance entity, the social part of the socio-ecological system, uh, which is ultimately lending its uh, legitimacy to this entire process. So this, this is what is fine-tuning the SES parameters, as you will. Uh, one important thing to note is that this um, uh, th this entity has its own token, typically, as well. So in, in the case of Toucan, um, uh, they will have a, a, a token. Um, Regen Network has a token. And Open Force Protocol has a, a native token re uh, representing governance rights in their DAO. And we're going to follow a very similar design with Colectivo, or we are following a similar design um, uh, with the Colectivo framework. So you, you just watched Luke's uh, amazing presentation. Um, if he's the captain of the enterprise, I'm the guy in the engineering bay. Um, at the very bottom here, we have what we call the meat space layer. Uh, that's the underlying material reality. Uh, above it, we have the monitoring. Above that, we have this very interesting standard that we're working on uh, called the Geo NFT, uh, where the, the Geo NFT has two major uh, components. The first is um, a topology, so it, it has a geography. We are able to, to articulate um, a point in space on a map or an area or something a little more elaborate, thanks to our friends at Astral Protocol. Um, and then the second part of the GeoNFT is a, a, a data store. So we have a place to take all of this data that, that we're, we are uh, collecting from this monitoring and, and, and put it. Uh, above that, we have the governance. So we will have Colectivo in, in our instance governing um, what's going on on the ground. And finally, we have our verification layer where we are creating some ecological asset based off of the data that's being collected. Cool. So uh, 
I have some thoughts here looking towards the future um, of, of SES design, especially in relation to Web3. Uh, the first is we need to broadly experiment beyond ecological state, and we need to do more experimentation across all parts of an SES. And this is, this is where Celo shines as an ecosystem. Celo has impact market. Celo has uh, taken truly seriously this mandate of financial access for all. Um, these are all important parts of an SES. There is a social component. If we can work towards poverty, if we can issue uh, universal basic income, we are hitting other parts of the system, which are very important parts. Um, second criticism, and this is a criticism that, that gets uh, articulated pretty frequently by, by traditional um, conservationalists, is that we, we not only need to incentivize regeneration or conservation or sequestration, we just need to stop using things. The number one way to intervene in this system is to reduce consumption. If we can do that, we have fixed three-fourths of the problem. My final observation here is that we need more practice with DAO tooling in local real-world context. We're going to, we went to Curaçao uh, recently, we had two weeks there with four um, uh, user researchers, and we were creating a lot of research that didn't exist before. And <laughs> that's cool, because you're doing something that's, that's totally new, but at the same time, um, it should not be totally new. We, we should be a little bit further, I think, and we, should, we, we plan to share that research on the Cello Forum um, so that all of you have those tools as well when you, when you start this journey. This is a, a chart that I kind of wanted to end with. Um, it's one of my favorite charts. It's called the Carbon Tunnel Vision Chart. I can't help but being a little self-critical. Um, again, we, we are looking only at the carbon part of the problem for the most part, or traditionally, uh, when creating ecological assets, um, that's what we've been looking at. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here, and that is great for everyone in this room, because it means that if you have a solution to one of these problems that you think can be implemented, um, there is a very wide space for you to play in, and you need to go play. Finally, and uh, I'm amazed I got through that in 17 minutes. That took me much longer before. Um, very last slide, a little bit about ourselves, because people are very curious about Curve Labs. Um, we are kind of, uh, we frame ourselves as an innovation network in the Web3 space, and the reason we do so is our, our primary strategy is to empower our neighbors in our ecosystem. Um, we are less concerned with, you know, being the, the de facto best agency that does whatever, and more being a good neighbor. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see some of our neighbors. We work in close partnership with Colectivo Labs, Block Science, Byte Rocket, and Zed Labs. These are all amazing dev, architecture, product, design shops. On the right-hand side, you can see the projects that we're engaged with. We are engaged with PrimeDAO. PrimeDAO is working on DAO-to-DAO inter-trade mechanisms. Uh, you can see Celo. You're all familiar. Uh, you can see Colectivo. Luke gave a great chat about Colectivo. Uh, Toucan Protocol. We have a, a design team today um, working on Toucan's tokenomics. Uh, Astro Protocol, which we are <laughs> having so much fun working on with the Geo NFT. And, and finally, The Sphere. The Sphere was a performing arts project that was funded by the Horizon 2020 grants program in the EU for experimenting with the DAO in the performing arts. So as you can see, we have a, a pretty fantastic and interesting roster of partners and uh, I suppose projects that we're working on. And we're looking forward to continuing to be uh, a pretty dynamic innovation network in the future. Thank you.